This is Twit. Big birthday this week. <laughs> I love the register. The register is so good at headlines. Beige against the machine. The IBM PC turns 40. 5150, not just a medical emergency. <laughs> also the beginning of the office brick. It was on August 12th, uh, 1981. Big Blue released the first IBM PC. We didn't call it the 5150. We call it the PC. Um, and it transformed a, an industry because up until then, there were lots of personal computers, Commodore and Atari and Apple, uh, IMSI, MITS, all had made personal computers, but they were very hobbyist focused. When IBM arrived, it gave it a serious business cachet. And remember the fa full page ad that uh, Steve Jobs took out in the Wall Street Journal saying <laughs> from Apple, welcome, IBM, seriously. They might have underestimated <laughs> the impact IBM would have. You do you remember, Mike, uh, the first PC and when it came out? Do you do you have a memory of that? Maybe you're not old enough. Um, I was not um, super paying attention at the point where that came out. It was more like the mid '80s when I started really getting into computers and stuff like that. But once I, you know, in 1990, I started editing a computer magazine that very quickly became Windows Magazine, and that whole you know, magazine thing in the 90s was 100% a direct, uh, you can draw a direct line to this very event that you're talking about, the creation of the IBM model 5150. And so, of course, we, you know, we were always writing about the history, the ancient history of the, uh, of, of the, you know, during the 80s of, of the IBM PC. And, you know, it really, it really, there are very few things that change the course of technology the way this did. It could have gone in whole different directions, but because they use open components, because they had a reverse engineerable BIOS, because they uh, idiotically uh, went uh, got in bed with Bill Gates. Um, <laughs> That's that a great set story, the tone. by the way. <laughs> that set the tone for everything to happen for the next 20, 25 years. So. Yeah. It was open. They chose off-the-shelf parts. The only thing that was proprietary was the BIOS. I don't think they designed it to be reverse engineerable, but it didn't take very long for Compaq and others, uh, Phoenix and others, to say, oh, we can make a PC-compatible BIOS, which meant that within a year, Compaq was selling a compatible. It would run okay. the same software, run the same opera. Oh, and that was the other smart thing. And the dumb thing that IBM did, they were looking for an operating system for the PC, uh, they f they came out to, to Monterey, California, because DR DOS was a very popular uh, operating system uh, in the CPM days. And Gary Kildall, who was a creator of uh, DR DOS, digital research uh, founder and president, was famously flying his private plane and declined to meet with IBM. So, yeah. So they flew up to Redmond, Washington, where there was another young upstart company, Microsoft, known for its basic not for an operating system. They met with Bill Gates and said, uh, we need an operating system for the PC. You got one? Bill said, um, yeah. He didn't. But he knew of a company called Seattle DOS, which had a DOS that would be compatible with IBM's 8088 chip, the chip that they were putting in there. It's an Intel chip. And uh, he, without telling the owners of Seattle DOS went across the street, said, I, you know, I'd like to buy Seattle DOS. Didn't mention that there was another uh, company in, interested, bought it for a song, and then turned around and sold it to IBM as PC DOS. The other thing that uh, Gates did, it was probably the single biggest business move in history. He made a deal with IBM, and I don't know why IBM agreed to this, not to give it to them outright, not to sell it to them outright, but to retain the rights to it. And and he looked like he was twelve at the time. Um, yeah, we got a, we got an offering. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but but the, to me, and actually, was, uh, that's funny because Seattle uh, DOS came from Seattle Computer Products, which was staffed by high school students. So <laughs> this right. remember in the early days, this is in the early uh, late late seventies, early eighties. This was a hobbyist thing. Nobody was right, serious. Exactly. About this. Yeah. I mean, he set the tone. I think as a, as a historian of Silicon Valley, he set the tone for the industry. So you had these well-meaning uh, uh, companies actually producing good products 
that were, you know, they were sort of relaxed about things. And then you have this bare knuckle, aggressive liar come along <laughs> and just, just, just have this just a hyper aggressive uh, attack on IBM saying that he had things he didn't have. And then a massive work ethic to go with it, willing to just do whatever it took. I mean, when he did the Altair basic, um, you know, he lived in a trailer in a, in a yeah. strip mall yeah. uh, and worked, you know, he dropped out of Harvard and worked night and day to make that deal happen. It's not like he's lazy. Oh God, he, no. it's just a combination. It's just a combination of massive work ethic, lots of brains, no ethics. And being a predatory businessman, basically. Exactly. And yeah. that set the tone for the Silicon Valley we know and love today. <laughs> he bought a uh, PC DOS uh, from Seattle computer products for $25,000, like the same month that IBM came to him and he didn't have anything. Um, just prior to the launch of the uh, PC on the August 12th, on July 27th, he, he went to Seattle to us and said, I'll give you another 50000 for full rights. Um, and they didn't know anything about the PC. They said, okay. So for $75,000, he bought an operating system, which basically made Microsoft. And then he made a deal with, with, with IBM saying, well, we'll keep the rights. We'll just license this to you. And I don't know why IBM agreed to it but what it made possible is the compatibles because then he was able to sell ms dos to compaq and all these other uh makers of pc compatibles and it made it com completely 100 percent ibm pc compatible which well, is good the thing for Apple us went through. right exactly but this is the thing that you know the in among the hobbyist market software was just nothing and hardware was everything uh they you know the hobbyists like uh, you know the the chaos computer club that Steve Wozniak was part of, they would just write software and hand it around and it was free. It was no big deal. And then the computers were the thing that right. monetary value. And and Bill Gates had the vision to understand, no, uh, whoever owns the software has all the, all the power. Don Estridge, a skunk works project out in Boca Raton. You know, IBM is up in Armonk, New York, up, to, up your way, Tim, <laughs> not quite so far North, not too uh, far away. <laughs> but not too far away. Uh, so they said, look, uh, you know, we're known for mainframes. Let's send a small team of engineers down to Boca Raton. And they're going to design something. What was the code name for the original IBM PC? I'm trying to remember. Had a good code name. Uh, project, let's see, Project Chess, according. But I don't know if that was the code name for the original PC. Anyway, they designed it. You may remember the, uh, do you remember the ads for the IBM PC? Acorn was the Acorn, yeah. Coding. Yep. Thank yep. you. Um Charlie Chaplin, remember these for the first let me see if I can find one. Yeah, they're beautiful ads. You know, while you're finding that, it's interesting that the low end model of the IBM PC had sixteen kilobytes. Kilobytes. Not of, of megabytes. Uh, I, just bought, I, I just bought a, a an iPad that has sixteen gigabytes I know. of RAM. I know, and some consider that uh low. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie Chaplin uh, with some of the original IBM uh, PC ads. They were going after business. It didn't the uh, the base model, which was fifteen hundred bucks, did not have floppy disks or a hard drive. Heaven for fend. It had a um, cassette interface, and you would save your programs and your files out to cassette. They did offer if you were willing to spend more, you could configure it all the way up to five thousand dollars. You could get dual floppies, no hard drive. There it is with the dual floppies. That big old CRT. It, you could either get it in a color, kind of a hideous... I can't remember how many colors it had. Uh, 256 colors. Or you could get it monochrome, green on black. The IBM personal computer. Try one on at a store near you. Yeah. Wow. 1981. 40 years ago. It's not that long, really. No. no. But boy, the world has changed thanks to that. Yeah, so Leo, he, then. yeah. Here, here's some interesting alternative history. Um, Gary Kildall, who uh, who started digital research in the Monterey area near where Tim's staying, um, says uh, in his unpublished memoir, which is actually available via the Computer History Museum, that uh, he and Bill Gates had talked about merging their companies. Oh, and in which case uh, Microsoft, which at the time was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, would have moved to Pacific Grove. Oh, that would have been wonderful. Mm. That still... would have been a, a very different uh, history of Silicon Valley. <laughs> I used to live on Lover's Seattle. Point in um, in Pacific Grove. I love that area. 
<laughs> but uh, Kildall, Kildall thought that uh, um, he he called uh, Bill Gates opinionated yeah. and uh, was always <laughs> uneasy around him. Yeah. So. And by the way, I think he has said that that's apocryphal, that he was flying around in an airplane. Um, maybe that's an urban legend, but it's a great urban legend. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for whatever reason, IBM didn't do a deal with him and went to a company that did not, in fact, have a PC DOS and, uh, and bought it from them. But Bill Gates didn't even have a tie. <laughs> when he went to the meeting and he had to, he had to borrow one or something. Is that true? Oh, about, wow. Oh, that's yeah, some story like that where he had to buy, bought one in the airport or something like that. I'm going to see if I can find I love these old, I'm, I don't know, maybe because <laughs> I'm an old timer. I just love these, these, um, here's the uh, welcome seriously uh, ad, I think. Let me see if I can find it here. It was in the Wall Street Journal. Cleverly positioning the upcoming battle as a two-way contest between the spunky and rebellious Apple and the uh, establishment Goliath. Yeah, here's an image of it from uh, Inc.com. Welcome, IBM. Seriously. Welcome to the most exciting and most important marketplace since the computer revolution began 35 years ago. And congratulations on your first personal computer. <laughs> <laughs> when we invented... The first personal computer system, maybe a little uh, hyperbole on that. We estimated that over 140 million people worldwide could justify the purchase of one if they only understood its benefits. Next year alone, we project that well over a million will come to that understanding. A million people. Wow. Little did he know what IBM was going to do and just kind of dominate the, the space. And to this day, still, PCs dominate. Not, so Apple's IBM not is, of, of course, completely out of that business. Yeah. No, they don't do it anymore. Yeah. Although they do have a two nanometer chip, so good to good. To, they're not they're not sitting on the resting on their laurels. Base price for a fifty one fifty one thousand five hundred sixty five dollars. Fully loaded system, more than three thousand dollars. You could have uh, monochrome or CGA. That was the one. And CGA did not <laughs> not have many colors at all. Sixteen or sixty four kilo bytes of ram the processor and intel 88 chugging along it and i do remember this 4.77 megahertz mega blistering blistering speeds. mega hertz so did apple have the last laugh they're still in the personal computer business 40 years on yeah they beat yeah. ibm yeah if anything ibm's mistake was making it so easy to clone but if you're talking about the platform that made that's why they were so successful you could clone a pc and so there are thousands of people to this day making what is essentially an ibm pc compatible still and microsoft even makes them that's them. right that's a good point happy birthday 40 years ago august 12th the ibm pc was born